Esta sexta edición demuestra esa necesidad de intercambio, esa necesidad de documentación sobre lo que significa la contemporaneidad en el campo creativo. Y creo que es muy importante para nosotros que vivimos en este país tomar en cuenta la carencia de información sobre la contemporaneidad. Es lamentable que nuestra universidad, la UNAM, en estéticas, tenga tan pocos investigadores que se dediquen a lo que sucede en la actualidad. Lo mismo puedo decir de la Ibero o de otras universidades. Creo que es muy importante que las instituciones, si algo les falta por hacer, sea por lo menos invertir en documentar lo que está sucediendo desde los años 60 en México para compartirlo con el resto del mundo. Hablando de nuestra mesa hoy, la responsabilidad de los, de los activistas culturales creo que cada día se vuelve más importante por la presencia dominante de un mercado que dicta el consumo del arte como otro de los productos consumibles. En ese sentido, cuando hablo de mercado, no hablo nada más de la compra o de la venta, hablo de las publicaciones, de las redes, de los proteccionismos, de las formas de integrar lo que llaman el mainstream, todas las cotas que hay que pagar para poder entrar en esto, la promiscuidad o las perversiones o las corrupciones. Y eso lleva a pensar si realmente esto es lo que quieren los artistas o los aficionados o los que comprometidos con la creación se dedican cada vez a transgredir lo establecido. En ese sentido, creo que nuestro papel es reflexionar sobre ese destino que el comercio quiere dedicarle al arte para simplificar sus contenidos, anestesiar a algunos de los intelectuales o artistas, ir proponiendo un menú tan diverso, a veces tan deslumbrante, pero tan artificial, que puede tal vez extraviar a muchos o abortar a muchos talentos. Y en ese sentido sabemos la debilidad de los que por el estrellato o por hoy día la pasarela pueden dedicarse a todas las formas de celebración que se dan en la institución. Creo que es importante pensar si la institución es capaz de responder a las necesidades de la sociedad actual o si realmente la institución se está actualizando para enterarse de lo que está pasando. En ese sentido, creo que activistas, artistas, críticos, curadores, hay una responsabilidad muy grande porque ustedes transminan la forma de entender o de aproximarse a lo que son las expresiones artísticas o culturales, de su compromiso, de su convicción como acto de fe, puede realmente el individuo diverso acercarse a lo que es esta expresión. Pero si dejamos la puerta abierta a la especulación, no digo tal vez la especulación intelectual, pero la negativa, pues corremos el riesgo de tener adornos, pero no obras de arte. Y en ese sentido creo que es muy importante que hoy nuestros panelistas nos muestren formas alternativas que van respondiendo a estas necesidades que a veces las instituciones no pueden colmar. Espero que nuestra mesa pueda incitar una reflexión que les permita a ustedes público participar interviniendo en sus preguntas para poder enriquecer ese debate. Muchas gracias. Iniciamos. No puedo leer todo lo que está escrito aquí porque la mayoría tiene en el programa, así que voy a adelantarme un poco en las presentaciones para poder dar más tiempo a las preguntas. Voy a iniciar con Joan Jonas. 
uh, es artista, profesor, profesora de performance en el programa de artes visuales en MIT, Cambridge. Jonas es pionera del videoarte y del performance y es una de las más importantes artistas surgidas de fines de los años 60 y principios de los 70. Comenzó su carrera en Nueva York como escultora. En 1968 mudó su trabajo hacia lo que entonces era territorio de vanguardia. Mezclar el performance con el video situados en ambientes naturales y o industriales. Entre 1972 y 1976, los video performances de Jonas incluyeron a un solo actor, ella, ella misma, actuando en su loft de Nueva York como Organic Honey, alter ego in inventado como una seductora er erótica electrónica cuyo rostro de muñeca reflejaba la exploración de la cámara con la imagen femenina fragmentada y de la mujer cambiando los roles. Mediante dibujos, disfraces, máscaras e interacciones con la imagen grabada, se lograban efectos relacionados ópticamente con una doble percepción y significado. Los performances de Jonas se realizaron a fines de los 60 y durante los 70 por primera vez para los artistas más importantes de su generación como Richard Serra, Robert Smithson, Dan Graham y Laurie Anderson. Su obra es más conocida en Europa que en Estados Unidos, país en el que el crítico Robert Krim escribió sobre su trabajo. La ruptura efectuada en las prácticas modernistas ha sido no re o reprimida o bien suavizada. Sin embargo, al representar su obra temprana o la más reciente, Jonas continúa encontrando nuevas capas de significado en temas y cuestiones de género e identidad que han animado su obra durante 30 años. Bienvenida, Jonas. Adelante. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here in Mexico, in particular, where I've been before several times, and um, as a guest of this uh, conference. I'm going to, I, I hope the people over here can see because we're projecting, um, we're going to project videos on this screen. So if you can't see, just walk over there. And what I'm going to show while I'm talking is a continuous, more or less, stream of moving images of, sep of different works, which I'll mention and identify as, they, as I show them. There's um, about four or five pieces that are being shown. But I'm going to talk during some of them, which the first one called Wind, which is a silent piece, and um, the second one, Organic Honey, the sound is very minimal. So the first three pieces where the sound is either silent or minimal, I will speak and then later on play the sound. Um, I think that my work, because it's performance-based, has something to do the way I think about it before I came here and heard other things that were said about the title, What's Left, What Remains. Um, it's a transitory uh, form, medium, that one can never experience unless one sees the physical um, act. And so from the very beginning, I began to translate my works into the medium of um, film and video. And so what you see there is Wind, which was made in 1968, and it was based on a performance that I did, an indoor performance. And um, just quickly to tell you that my work from the very beginning in stepping from sculpture into the performing space was influenced by my research, which wasn't really, I wouldn't really call it research. I was kind of passionately interested in many things, as everybody was, in particular um, the history of film, the anthology film archives, which um, existed then in Soho near where I lived. Um, I went there almost every 
every night or several times a week and really learned about the history of early, early film. And um, modernist poetry was another inspiration. My work is based, I tried to look outside of the immediate art world. And so the way I developed a kind of form and uh, dealing with content was to think of the form and formal structure of film and poetry. So when I say poetic, I don't mean in a romantic sense. Um, another inspiration because of my study of art history was how myth is, um, is uh, referred to, has been referred to in, say, painting, sculpture from the very earliest times and how it continues to be referred to. For instance, James Joyce uses myth to the myth of Daedalus, which is a Greek myth, to, um, to indicate something more about the character of the main, the main persona. And that, that was what really inspired me to think about how to relate myth to my own work. Although in the beginning it was, it was hidden and ritual. When I first began to perform, um, I thought, well, who am I and where am I and what am I doing, doing these, these actions for, for my friends, which they were. That was what the audience was, the art world. It was a small world then, by the way. Um, and so I looked at the myth and ritual of other cultures and was inspired by that and um, really modeled my, my, the idea behind my performances and the idea of ritual. Um, I was, my work is also, um, I'm telling you all these things because it hasn't really changed. I think the ideas you have in the very beginning are carried out throughout your life in a certain sense. So my work has always been passed. It began, I've used uh, four, four main mediums. The, um, the medium of the mirror, the mediums that transform and translate the image. The mirror, I, I made vi uh, mirror pieces. As a matter of fact, this was my first, you can notice that the costumes that the characters are wearing are covered with mirrors. And then performers carried large mirrors um, in these very formal performances in gymnasiums and lofts. And um, the pieces were about 20 minutes long. And uh, the mirrors broke up the space, reflected the uh, performers, the space itself, and the audience, which was included in the performance because they saw themselves in the piece. Then I was also interested in how this might make people uncomfortable because mirrors are very complex, by the way. Um, Borges was my main inspiration for these early mirror pieces. Labyrinths had just been translated into English at that time in the 60s. Um, and everybody, you know, you can imagine people were just um, really involved with his, with his work at that time. And so I wrote down everything, every reference to the mirror that he had in his book, Labyrinths, and memorized it and then recited it as I did a performance in these mirror costumes. Um, and then the second medium was the deep landscape space of, I started performing outdoors, and some of you saw the film Song Delay just now, which was uh, an, a translation, I call these translations because the performance is never presented as it is, it's a translation into another medium of film and it's called Song Delay. The first piece was called Delay Delay. Jones Beach piece was at Jones Beach and the audience was a quarter of a mile away from the performance. And that affected the way the images and the sound were perceived by the audience. And then video, the closed circuit video um, was the third medium. And I'll talk more about that later. And then finally, narrative, the medium of narrative. And now I'm going to um, I'm going to switch to a, reading my text. So I'll switch back and forth. And this is a text um, that Douglas Crimp wrote about my work. And I think it says, better than anybody has, something about the work. A single strategy, paradigmatic in this respect, informs all of the work. That strategy is desynchronization, usually in conjunction with fragmentation and repetition. These latter were initially explored in the early performances with mirrors. Desynchronization is fir first fully operative in the outdoor works, Jones Beach Piece and Delay Delay. 
In those events, performers made loud noises by clapping blocks of wood together in wide overhead arcs. Because of the vast distance between performers and spectators, the gesture was seen well ahead of the sound it produced, making the gesture one of silence and sound came, seemed to come from nowhere. Both because of the number of performers clapping blocks and because the sounds were repeated with their own echoes, it was impossible to link sound and gesture. In this very simple way, Jonas enforced a separation between the spectator's sense of sight and hearing, making them aware of the contingency of perceptual experience. Desynchronization was intensified and complicated by the use of video technology in the indoor performances. The videotape entitled Vertical Roll, related to the organic honey performances of the early 70s, serves as an emblem for this activity. Here, the desynchronization of the monitors receiving and transmitting frequencies causes the images constantly to scan vertically across the screen, disappearing off the top and re reappearing at the, <clears throat> at the bottom. The viewer is far more aware of this hypnotic vertical motion than of any movement internal to the image itself, which can only be glanced. I might mention another major influence on my work um, has been my travels, and I'm not going to speak more about Delay Delay. Delay Delay was filmed in the empty lots in downtown New York, and the audience was sitting on the roof of a loft building looking down at the performance, which took place over an area of about 10 blocks. Um, there are certain elements. Um, if you think about sound and the use of space uh, and time, the use of time as material. Um, basically, time in those early works, this, by the way, the piece that's playing now is called Organic Honey's Visual Telepathy. But the time of these early works, in the outdoor works, time was experienced in one way, in the indoor works in another way, when the audience was in the same space and close. I'm going to mention um, a trip to Japan I did come to Mexico in the 60s, and I'll mention more about another journey I made in the 60s later. But in 1970, I had just been to Japan, where I saw the no drama. No and Kabuki theater used the sounds of wood hitting wood. The sounds are very clear. Some stages are designed with large ceramic jars underneath so that they resonate and become percussive surfaces. I love that sound. I had never been to an Eastern country before, and when I visited Tokyo and Kyoto, where the temples are, I was very aware of sounds. Seeing and sitting in the Japanese gardens was also a strong experience. The apparent simplicity of the gardens and the no affected me deeply. Many Western artists have been influenced by Eastern theater, which is basically a visual dance form relating to poetic language. Um, so I mentioned the no theater because it influenced very much these early outdoor works and the video works because um, when I went to Japan, I also, I also bought a video camera, my first um, port-a-pack, and brought it back to New York. And that changed my path in a certain sense. It altered my direction a bit because it gave me the opportunity to make what I called films in my loft immediately. And just in relation to what's been mentioned before, I'll say that I did go to college and art school, studied art history, studied art, but nothing that I, that's not true. Um, the main, the bulk of what I do now, I did not learn in art school. When I went to um, art school, I, I worked in clay from the model, and I actually learned how to draw in art school, which is something I continue to, to I use the act of drawing in all of my work because I think it's a basic, it's the basic um, form of art making, the line to draw. And so, um, but the difference between what we're talking about and the lack of um, access to information. I then went to New York. I went to Columbia Graduate School. Still, there was no, there was no correspondence between graduate school and, at Columbia and what was going on then in the contemporary art world. So I had to 
after I left school, I just plunged into the New York art world. And that was the difference, I think, because I learned everything I know about that aspect of my work then in the street, more or less. And I think most artists had that experience at that time. And now the situation is quite different, of course. But I just wanted to mention that. Now, this is another statement, wait a minute. Excuse me. <clears throat> another um, point is that I produced all my own pieces. There were no curators going around searching for artists, new work, new young work. I mean, there, were, there was in a way, and, and it was very nice, but not, the way, not in the same sense that what's happening now. And so people like me, um, well, I got grants, and I, I made my own posters, and my friends and I would go around Soho and put the posters up. We'd address all the envelopes and send the invitations out. You know, we made our own audiences. That, that was, it was the beginning of that. So this is a statement I made at that time about um, this, this aspect of stepping from sculpture into performance. I didn't see a major difference between a poem, a sculpture, a film, or a dance. A gesture has for me the same weight as a drawing. Draw, erase, draw, erase, memory erased. While I was studying art history, I looked carefully at the space of painting, films, and sculpture. How illusions are created within a framed space and how to deal with a real physical space with depth and distance. When I switched from sculpture to performance, I just went to a space and looked at it. I would imagine how it would look to the audience, what they would be looking at, how they would perceive the ambiguities and illusions of the space. An idea for a piece would come from just looking until my vision blurred. I also began with a prop such as a mirror, a cone, a TV, a story. The objects I use are not literal ab adaptations of the elements in the story or concept, but are symbolic, archetypal. The cone was an instrument to channel sound to the audience. I could whisper in their ears, look through it, listen to it, yell through it, sing, always directing sound to a place. Organic Honey's visual telepathy evolved as I found myself continuously investigating my own image in the monitor of my video machine. I then bought a mask of a doll's face which transformed me into an erotic seductress. I named this TV persona Organic Honey. I became increasingly obsessed with following the process of my own theatricality as my images fluctuated between the narcissistic and a more abstract representation. The risk was to become too submerged in solipsistic gestures in exploring the possibilities of female imagery. Thinking always of a magic show, I attempted to fashion a dialogue between my different disguises and the fantasies they suggested. I always kept my eye on the monitor in the performance space in order to control the image making. Now this is organic honey, and um, I had been to the Southwest to see the Hopi snake dance. I'm gonna mention this later. And in this, you'll see the Hopi doll, the Hopi kachina doll, in that, um, as a prop, used as a prop to make a kind of visual story. And I used props that I acquired without explaining why or how. When I first began to make video performances, I started to work with smaller props. And at first, the objects that I used were things that I had in my life that my grandmother had given me, for example, because they told a story, or ones that I found in flea markets that had a similar charge. All along, I was very influenced by and, in and interested in film and used the language, the structure of cuts, and the idea of montage to produce a video work. This process was then, because of the medium of video, more direct than working with film. I translated ideas of film into the peculiarities of video. I worked with small objects in relation to the camera to tell a story. It was all about finding the female image in this organic honey work, if there was such a thing. At that time, the idea of feminism or questioning female identity was a central subject of many female artists. Everybody was affected by that movement. In this case, Organic Honey was the name I gave myself, and I created this persona or Earl to Eager by dressing up and using certain things like old fans and masks and so on. Now we're gonna to switch to the next, um, I can't see what's there, so I'm sorry, I'm not following exactly. We're going to switch now to Glass Puzzle. And I just want to talk for a minute about um, 
the main um, setup or structure of those video pieces was the closed circuit, the camera and the monitor, the camera focusing on the image, myself or objects, at which would appear in the monitor and I would be, in, I wanted to show the process of the image making to the audience. And in the performance, the audience saw simultaneously the live big picture of the performance with the close up, which was a detail um, on the monitor or in a projection. And the camera was part of the performance with a camera woman being a, another performer, but purely as a camera woman that I directed. Um, when I made Vertical Roll, uh, it was made by videotaping off the monitor the images that were passed to the monitor by the second camera or the first camera. The first camera was used in the space to videotape my movements. The second camera, and then passed to the monitor. The second camera videotaped those because you cannot, you, you cannot, you can only record the vertical roll by recording off the monitor. And um, Glass Puzzle was a piece that um, came out of this process and it was never, although there was a performance called Funnel in which I made a paper set, a, a piece, a set out of um, photographic backdrop paper and wooden poles. Um, and Glass Puzzle sort of came out of that, but it was something in itself was about the relationship of the monitor to the camera, to the performance, to the space. And that's something else that's, that's no longer with us, the monitor and the space of the monitor, the space of the closed circuit, that physical space. Um, I was talking to Julia Sher about this and she said her students in Cologne, they just, they stream video, that there's no more, um, there's no more of that. Now, that, now there's this um, term real space, but then there was a real space of the um, performance of the monitor of the closed circuit. So I was very interested in that space and in the space of the monitor and I imagined myself being able to crawl into the monitor. It was a box and um, it was related to the larger space of the performance and also the bigger space of the outdoor work and all of these spaces were framed of course and again as I said before I referred to the, the idea of framing from looking at paintings but glass puzzle we queued all these tapes up before we started, but we can't get them. It's okay. This is a kind of streaming that's going on now. Um, glass puzzle that I made, um, Babette Mangold was on the camera. Usually I do my own camera, almost always, but in this case Babette was on the camera and Lois Lane was performing with me. And I made a, a, a physical, I made a, um, there are two things that are going on, the camera, filming off the monitor that you'll see in a minute. And you'll see the reflection of the room in the monitor and the space that I made with black and white paper that we performed in. And so we were playing with the reflections and those spaces and so that it's creating different illusions of space and ambiguities of space, which um, interested me. And this, the sound in this is very minimal. Why don't we just look at this for a minute and turn up the sound. Because I have more. By the way, this piece is inspired by the photographs of a photographer called Belloc, who photographed prostitutes in New Orleans at the turn of the century. And he photographed, maybe some of you have seen his photographs, he photographed the models, the prostitutes, in their rooms. It looks like they're waiting for men, and they're all posing with their objects, and they're standing in front of 
these white sheets or pieces of paper, I don't know what, as backdrops. And so I was very inspired by those photographs. And at the time, I was questioning the roles that women play. And this was one of the roles that I thought of. And so this piece is all about women in the space by themselves and what they do when they're waiting, some of them. I'm going to move on now because we we queued it up at the wrong place. So now I'm going to we'll play the next piece. It's about six minutes long because it, I'll just say a little bit before you start to play it. It's um, it's from the performance of Lines in the Sand. It was recorded in the kitchen, which was um, commissioned by Documenta 11, and it's based on the poet H.D.'s poem Helen in Egypt, which um, involved the story of Helen of Troy, who never according to this legend, which is old, uh, ancient, an ancient legend, that she never went to Troy, she went to Egypt instead, and therefore the Trojan War was fought for an illusion. And that's one of the things that interested me about this story, is that war is fought for other reasons than they were told. And um, in order to, um, one of the, the location for much of the action, I decided to go to Las Vegas, because there's a casino in Las Vegas called Luxor, and it's a, very, it's a big glass pyramid with a really vulgar uh, sphinx in front of it. And um, the whole situation in Las Vegas inter interested me. And the text is um, an intercutting of the poetry of H.D.'s Helen in Egypt with the text that she wrote in, about her analysis with Freud in the 30s. And I'm just showing you this before I finish because with Lines in the Sand because it also has something to do with the 30s and I became drawn to that period of the time before the Second World War because I felt like we were in that period again in a certain sense, all right. Sound is a collaboration with Paul Miller, DJ Spooky, and Stephen Vitello. Harry Parch, this is.
in your hands. Teach me to remember. Teach me not to remember. That piece led up to Lines in the Sand because, as you can see, the kind of elaborate use of backdrops as a kind of parallel narrative to the, the, uh, central, uh, the central narrative of the text. And I think in finishing, we'll just play Lines in the Sand, silent, I mean, the shape, the scent, the feel of things without the sound because many, some of you saw it, and I'm sorry there's not time to show you more, but I wanted to have time to read this statement about the shape, the scent, the feel of things, which followed this, which was a piece commissioned by the Dia um, Foundation in Be and was performed in the basement of Dia Beacon in, uh, outside of New York City. This project, the shape, the scent, the feel of things, goes back to a journey I made 40 years ago to the Southwest, where I had the opportunity to see several Hopi rituals, including a performance of the Hopi snake dance. Although I have never used it in a performance, this very special experience has inspired my work ever since. About 10 years ago, I came across a reference to the dance in an essay by the German art historian Abby Warburg in images from the region of the Pueblo Indians of North America by Michael Steinberg. In his investigations, Warburg used photographs of artworks from different cultures, across different cultures, recombined and cross-referenced to produce a display for example, certain gestures as portrayed by Greeks, Romans, Indians, and so on. He made many such displays on board dealing with various themes. He similarly recombined the placement of books in his library, an action that evoked the different relations between their subjects. The Warburg's trip to the Southwest, which profoundly altered his view of art history, took place at the end of the 19th century. He did not produce his famous text until 30 years later, as he was recovering from a mental breakdown at a sanatorium in Switzerland at around the same time that, um, a little earlier than HD was being analyzed by Freud. He wrote it as a cure or proof of one to himself as much as to his physicians, and the audience became the physicians in this um, performance. Although he did see certain dances and rituals, Warburg never saw the Hopi snake dance, but I was struck by his descriptions of it and by the depth of his concern with the culture. I made another trip to the Southwest in January 2004 with a project like this specifically in mind. I stayed on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona and began a dialogue with people in the community, but I did not wish to impose on or take away from the Native Americans. I decided instead to return to Warburg's writing. I found myself, for instance, focused on Durer's melancholia reproduced in Steinberg's essay to me, melancholia evokes memories of history as it impacted the American landscape. In a sense, I am, am approaching an old experience as Warburg did decades later through new work for which the words are not, not yet completely present. This project is a result of an ongoing concern with the subject of ritual and performance. One of the underlying themes of my work has been my involvement with the beginnings of expression in other cultures in relation to my own. There has not always been a direct relation between the image and the source, but of course the performance is totally inspired by these sources while it takes form within and is a response to a very particular space. Uh, thank you. Gracias, Jonas. Vamos a continuar con nuestro siguiente ponente y después uh, daremos uh, un espacio para las intervenciones. Amar Canuar es artista y cineasta independiente que reside en Nueva Delhi. Uh, una presentación de Little Museum, el pequeño museo, 
una presentación desde el subconsciente indio sobre la imagen que descansa entre el dolor y la resistencia. Las películas de Amar son complejas narrativas contemporáneas que conectan con esferas personales, íntimas, de la existencia hacia procesos sociopolíticos mayores. Sus filmes vinculan leyendas y objetos rituales a nuevos símbolos y eventos públicos que alteran emocional e intelectualmente al espectador. Al encontrar una relación de contexto con el público, la obra de Canoir traza un viaje de exploración que revela la relación con las políticas del poder, la violencia, la sexualidad y la justicia. Canoir recibió el premio Edward Munch de Arte Contemporáneo de Noruega, un doctorado honorario en Bellas Artes del Main College of Art en Estados Unidos, la beca MacArthur en India, el premio Golden Gate Festival de Cine de San Francisco, la Concha de Oro Festival Internacional de Cine de Mumbai, el primer premio Festival Internacional de Cine de Turín, Italia, el gran premio Enviro, Enviro Film, República Eslovaca y el Árbol de Oro en el primer Festival Nacional de Cine del Medio Ambiente y Vida Salvaje, Batavarán, en Nueva Delhi. Se programó una retrospectiva de su trabajo en el Festival de Cortometraje de Dhaka en 2005. Sus películas se han proyectado tanto en pequeños festivales de cine rurales como en festivales internacionales y museos, como el Museo de Arte Moderno de Nueva York, el Museo Nacional de Oslo, Noruega, y participó en Documenta 11 en 2002 y en Documenta 12 en 2007 en Kassel, Alemania. Bienvenido, Amar. Cedemos la palabra a Amar. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to, to share and learn so much. It's hard to explain how happy I am to be here. Um, I'm going to begin uh, with some uh, just random thoughts, uh, try and talk a little bit about my work and then get into a text that I've written. Um, we are remembering I think she said the mic. We are remembering something, a massacre that happened in 40 years ago and so I just felt uh, like beginning with a little film which is also uh, a homage and I'd just like to show that first. It's a silent film for four minutes and after which I'll continue. So we play the first DVD. It's, uh, it's, it's not dark, it'll be a little faint, but...
was part of the 1988 generation of students from Burma, Myanmar, known as the 88 Group. By, 19, by 1988, Burma had already witnessed uh, uh, a couple of decades almost of a very brutal military regime. Uh, one, or maybe more than one entire generation of students had been pretty much wiped out, killed, prisoned. Uh, many artists and singers had already spent many years in jail by 1988. 8th August 1988, which is like a, maybe some of you know the date, 8888, um, is an important date in the history of Burma and the student movement of Burma. Uh, that was from 88. On the 8th of August, uh, many students came out to demonstrate for a series of reasons that led up, uh, came out to demonstrate in the main streets of Rangoon, Rangoon University. This was a kind of demonstration where you had uh, high school students, uh, engineering students, medical students, not just social science students, but you had students from all over. And you had parents telling kids, uh, yes, go out, it was important, it is important to go out and protest. Um, so, you know, in groups, groups of school students also went out and joined uh, senior students demonstrating. And the military uh, had decided to crack down on the 8th of August and uh, there was a brutal massacre. Many hundreds were killed, many hundreds f fled and hid. Uh, they soon learned that uh, the army was looking for them and that it was appropriate and better if they remained in hiding for a few more, <clears throat> for a few more days. Uh, after a few days, they learned that uh, the army was still out, curfew was still on, uh, streets were being searched, uh, photographs had been taken, so it was better to remain in hiding for a little longer. This continued for quite a while. Several of them left town, remained in hiding in other cities, Several of them went into the forests, joined other militant groups of the various ethnic nationalities that were fighting an armed resistance against the Burmese military. The students went and joined, they lived in the forest, they set up barefoot universities, they set up camps, they learned how to fight, they picked up arms, they stayed for many years, some continued to stay, but it was hard to do that. Every time they would think of going back, they would be told that the houses are, their homes are under surveillance. Several of them escaped out of the forests, went into Bangkok, into Thailand. Several of them came towards the northeastern part of India or uh, in the state of Manipur and Imphal. When they crossed both borders, wherever they left, uh, the police of both countries, Thailand, India, arrested them and so on. It's a long story. One year passed, two years passed, three years passed. They never returned home. In a sense, they, they went out for a demonstration thinking that they would be back by evening. It's been more than 15 years since they've come back. They haven't returned. From, 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 from the border areas, they went into the main cities. From the main cities, they went into other countries and then across the world. They still exist in many, many countries and many cities still fighting, still struggling. Parents have died. A telephone call could very often has meant uh, a sister or a brother or the person who's received the telephone call being arrested. Uh, so you, you, you don't call, actually you don't call for five years, 10 years. You get to know sometimes that somebody, that your mother has died maybe a little later, you know, after a year or so. It's an incredible students movement, much larger than several of the other students movement that we're familiar with that have so much recognition. Several generations have gone down and just recently was the September uprising. The September uprising was after, after commemorating the, the August. Uh, they waited till August and then, then September happened. Everybody knew that something would happen. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a rule by the military government in, in Burma even now that every, every published um, item any, any, whether it's a sports magazine, whether it's a book of poetry, whether it's a newspaper or a storybook, on the first page of every published item, a set of statements released by the military government 
by law have to be printed. These are fairly innocuous statements about how the military government will take the country to uh, you know, where it should go and so on. But nevertheless, if you don't have them, you would get arrested, you cannot publish. I began working um, with, with Burmese refugees, got interested in the Burmese issue in Delhi. They were Burmese refugees uh, in, in Delhi. Um, it's a long story. Uh, they hijacked a plane from, from Thailand with a bar of soap, which is another story. Um, but, um, and began to start working in some way uh, just to make what I, what I felt was in some way to commemorate, to honor, to respect, to remember uh, such an incredible uh, and continuous students' movement. In 1996, there was a bookshop owner in Mandalay by the name of Kotante, who found it very difficult to sell books, books of poetry, books that he really liked, with this military statement on the first page. For you to understand what it means to be in Burma, it's necessary, for instance, if you're a journalist and there's a football tournament and you feel that there's been some corruption that's happened in the football tournament and you write about a possibility of corruption, it is possible that you may go into jail for 10 years. If Deutsche Welle makes a telephone call of a radio station, BBC makes a call and you pick up and, and you, you do the interview on the phone, your family and you could go in for 20 years. Uh, it's scary business, actually, to protest in Burma. Uh, Kotante began to quietly tear the first page of every book that he sold. Uh, he never told anybody, he never showed it to anybody. Uh, he would just tear the first page and hide the page and, and kept selling. And I think he sold for a few years until they found out. They found several torn first pages on him and he was sent to prison. Uh, a few years in prison and torture, subsequently released, subsequently back in his bookshop in Mandalay. I just, I found this, um, this was something that I, that always amazed me about the students from Burma as to how, how they could carry on in, in spite of such an incredible tragedy, how they could just keep on fighting. Uh, and 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 um, so the series of film that I, films that I made and started to make all came under a project called the Torn First Pages, of which the first one that you saw about the irony uh, of that date. Um, we have every head of state who comes to India has to visit Gandhi's cremation ground and pay his respects. So when the Supreme General of the Burmese military was invited. Uh, he had to go there. Uh, probably the most brutal man at present, the most brutal dictator, had to go uh, to Gandhi's grave and pay his respects. Uh, so I thought I'd make a little film, uh, just, just so that we can see what this guy looks like, and to protest as well, and to make them smile as well. And then later, um, to broadcast it through illegal satellite from Malaysia into Burma. It's illegal to see this. Uh, but uh, probably made a lot of other Burmese smile. So I'd just like to show this. There's, there's the sound. Uh, the sound is Gandhi's favorite, favorite hymn that he used to, used to like. So you see that for four minutes, and then I get into my presentation. I just managed maybe about a minute and a half, uh, about a second and a half. Is it really unclear what I'm saying? No, in front of the people is not listening. Hmm? The people is not, it's because of the brand.
There's always somebody watching. Um, most people in Europe and America, uh, I find, are surprised to hear that 68 was important as far as the Indian subcontinent was concerned. 68 was incredibly important for, for all of us. I won't go into it at great length, except to say that it, it changed the lives of not only that generation, but at least a few generations afterwards and continues to do that on a daily basis across the country. If anything happened in Nepal, if Nepal became a republic just a few weeks ago, it's because of 68. So um, I begin my presentation speaking about a man who left, who was from, from that generation in the 60s, who was an engineer, who left Calcutta to go to Chhattisgarh and work in a Bhilai steel plant as a worker in the boiler. His name is Shankar Gohan Yogi. One day, I'm reading and I'll read slowly. One day, 17 years ago, summer had ended it was dark. They were all sitting, a few inside, mostly on the road. In the center on the tarmac, talking in whispers, gas lamps, the evening empty, unable to go home. As the night came, I realized it was sinking in, that Nyogi had died, that he was no more. 20 years ago, Nyogi was the one who had made them come together, and now they had all come again. Their leader had been shot dead. In the early hours of the morning, through the window, two men on a bike slipped by and took his life. Now this evening, they had cremated him. Now, just a few hours ago, red and green powder flew in the air. Slogans shook the building in the marketplace. People wept, stared in silence, averted their gaze, touched their lips, shut their eyes, looked up at the sky, at the ground, as his body rolled by the streets. 10, 20, 100,000 spread all over. And then suddenly it was dusk. It was over. Time never stops, no matter what. I had come too late, late by a day. He had asked two months ago for a filmmaker. He had asked, is there any young person with a camera? who is free, who has time, who can understand, who can come and stay here for a while with us, between the mines and the forests, amongst the workers and the peasants, alongside the forest dwellers and the police, and the goons and the henchmen, beside the politicians and the bootleggers, the corporate advisors and the petty traders. 
in the dust of iron ore mines, in the evening haze of the Bilai steel plant, and the trucks from the cement factories. Is there anyone with a camera who can come for a while? I had said, yes, I can, but I had come too late, by a day or two, for they shot him yesterday. I realized that he knew that he would be attacked. He had refused security. It was a mistake. He should have asked for protection. Instead, he had asked for a filmmaker. I filmed the funeral procession, the smoke from the pyre, the faces of the people, and now it was night. A night that I cannot forget, everyone refusing to leave. Slowly, the huddled groups grew louder. Discussions retreated. Voices became soft and intense. Wait here, a worker said to me. No, I said I will come with you. On his cycle, back seat with a camera. No light, only a few lamps flickering all over. We raced from group to group. I rolled, almost no image but clear sound, recorded on tape. The cycle wheels, the pedals, and the clear voice of the carter. I still did not understand the tension that spread silently across the dark streets when, su when suddenly slogans ripped open the night sky. A hundred workers appeared in a golden haze. Torchlights. They were going to burn down the city. We know who killed him, they said. We will take justice ourselves, they said. But Nyogi had put in place a string of leaders. He had left behind one leader for every 10 families. That's what the police and the industry want. That's what they expect you to do. That's what they're waiting for. Silently and fiercely, this debate moved like a river down in the streets, in the little offices, through the dark huts, split the torch lights into two directions. Take them away from the city. For if you retaliate tonight, they will sweep the workers' colonies. In one stroke, they will break us all down. My camera rolled, focusing on a small yellow bulb, the only light amongst 50 men. Insects whizzed around the hot glass curve. Focus on the filament. Forget the grain in the image. Listen to the voices. Keep rolling. This was no ordinary darkness. This was no ordinary bulb. This was no ordinary moment. The moment passed in a while. It was strange. Everyone here was struggling to deal with his death. But he, of course, had accepted it, for he knew he would be killed. As the audio tape that he had recorded and left behind revealed. Many years later, through the delusion of solitude, I did thank him for calling for a filmmaker to the scene of a crime to be. Just last year, after a decade in court, they sentenced the hired assassin to life. He was also a poor man with a gun who fired for a small sum of money. They acquitted those who hired him. They acquitted those responsible for the conspiracy to murder. Again, death beckons the artist. Death has many answers. Who killed him? Why did they want to consume the forests and all that lay underneath? What was this greed that could drive someone to kill? Drop falling in ocean, everyone knows. Ocean falling in drop, a rare one knows. Now listen, the wandering poet shouted. Who calls out your name? Is it life or is it death? Who calls out your name? Recently, I met a man. Nidhan was his name. Ne means without. Dhan means wealth. He lived in a village that had been home to his ancestors for many generations. Streams sprouted all around from inside the soil. No one was obsessed with the origin of the source. 
The waters came from inside the hill because the hills were special. Under his village lay 173 tons of bauxite. One day, the democratic government of India sold all the hills to the aluminium cartels across the world. I asked him in the forest, by the hill, under a tree, on the grass, by the stream, under the sky. Nidhan, the nation needs aluminium. Why do you resist? After all, it's a question of the entire nation's good in comparison to these few scattered villages. He looked at me in the eye, expressionless, and picked up his scythe, he had a knife, and picked it up and lay on, that lay on the ground and said, do you see this knife? With this I can cut grass. How would you describe that action? You would describe it as the act of cutting. Now if you take the same knife and cut my throat, how would you describe this action? Again, you could describe it as cutting, like a verb. The knife cut here, the knife cut there. Then he asked me, can you explain to me the difference between these two cuttings? Once you explain to me the difference between these two cuttings, I will then answer your question and explain to you the difference between the nation's good and our good and the good of this valley. Between these two questions, these two verbs hanging in midair is a frame with an image that lies in a little museum down the street in the corner in a small rented room. Is there an image there for that look in his eye? The look that maybe I know the meaning of? The little halt, a brief sigh inside the eye? The steam disappeared from the window pane of that little room into the sunlight that shines on the new lemon grass leaves that I now suddenly see. I realized then that it had rained through the night that I had been lost in that look longer than I knew. Is there an image for that look in, our, in your eye, the look that only I know the meaning of? It was my mother's birthday. I knew, but I had forgotten that it was her 70th. Is there an image for that forgetting? Tet Winong was a student leader in Burma. They sentenced him to 59 years in prison. Is there an image for the length of that sentence? They met for an hour, not knowing that they will never meet again. Is there an image for the realization 15 years later that this was the last meeting? The hypocrisy of his beautiful car screams down the highway as it races through the yellow mustard fields, watched by the farmer's sons and ignored by the visiting purple moo hens that were busy finding food in the wet soil. Is there an image for the scream? More than 100,000 farmers have committed suicide in India in the last two years. Is there an image for this genocide? They created an image that was meant to lie. They then created another image to convince me about the truth of that lie. They obliterated every dream I had. My home, my love, my family, my land, my trees, my river. They annihilated every sign of my ancestors. They disregarded every plea and discredited my anger. Is there an image for the hope that still lies in my heart? Is there an image for the fear that refuses to leave their heart? If the, mind comes from the, if the image comes from the mind's eye, then can it ever be separated from the food that was cooked last night when he began to tell the story of that day when everything seemed lost and a strange sinking feeling took over? In the story, they waited doing nothing, endlessly unable to even express their grief when one day there was a knock on the door. The little girl who was now big opened, her, opened the door. 
She came in, took a step, and then stood silently and wept as her eyes saw all of us sitting, staring at her. Happiness had returned, and the blood began to flow inside our bodies again. The image is that icon within which the blood flows, within which memories oscillate relentlessly and silently between the past and the future, our gaze being the present. We and the image together become the totem for the story telling to begin between her ancestors and the squirrel on the branch outside your window. To read the image means to resonate with this dialogue between memory and time, but in every direction. For the moment, the rest is bogus, irrelevant, mythical facades of color and light, like a series of mirages manufactured by a profit-making monster. Is it not so? So many images surround us continuously eating away at our insides so that we lose the sense of what is real and important, so that every word begins to have two meanings, its real meaning and its opposite as well. So eventually, you do not know what to believe, and so all beliefs become meaningless. Is there a reason to remember? Do you know the way to that little museum? Why are the images there different from the others? Why does an image seem to contain many secrets? What is it that can release them so as to connect with many unknown lives? If I find the ordinary icon, the secrets that lie within that image, the dialogues that reside there, then do I find meaning for myself? If I find meaning, then my audience finds meaning as well. The two meanings, mine and theirs, will never be the same, and should not as well. When I find myself, the audience finds themselves too. Is there an unseen line through the center of the dancer's body? What happens to her when she finds it during a performance? Is a film a series of still images? Is life a series of still moments where each moment contains time, birth, and death? And does time keep oscillating back and forth through every moment, even as it moves forward towards a destination? Or maybe time has no end, and it continues forever. Or maybe it's revolving, it's a revolving ellipse of a million layers, each layer marginally displaced from the other, with lives repeating at different times. Or maybe time occasionally leaves behind something. Is there a way to see that which seems to have disappeared, but hasn't? Is there a reason to remember? But not everyone archives in the same way. So maybe time does not move in a straight line. Maybe it can also originate from points and spread in many directions, even as it moves forwards and backwards. Like a forest and its inhabitants remembering, so as to allow the seasons to burn, moisten, and freeze memories in cyclical dialogue. Constantly interconnecting, so every revelation triggers a cascade of revelations, just like the rain. It was 47 degrees when we reached. The young boy said, this is it. This is where we have to go. The driver looked around incredulously, surprised and confused, and then silently withdrew to let others do what they want to do. Can we go under that tree in the shade for a while? Yes, we could. In a little while, the hot air suddenly rose up silently, taking with it a handful of dry leaves. A mini tornado-like swirl just about 10 feet high. A spray of dust levitating vertically below the leaves. Was it a message since we had just arrived? Only for a lunatic, the boy replied with scorn in his eyes. One hour later, now in the small forest, 
silent, probably because of the white heat of the afternoon. Again, everything dry, brown, about to crackle. Another quiet gust of wind. A vertical swirl, swirl of air, leaves and dust, but this time twice as high, almost as high as the trees. Still not a message? I asked. Yes, the boy smiled and admitted. It is. It's a salam. What else can it be? Is there an image for the space that exists between the eye of the witness and the scene of crime? Can the witness be a tree? Can I draw a graph marking the dates of her trial in court on the silhouette of the hill where she hid? Is there an image for the afternoon, evening and night and for that which is spoken and unspoken? There but not there? To be remembered but to be forgotten continuously? For the survivor who is still hiding? Is there an image for hiding? Just the day before I left for here, she won her case. After five years in court, the judge finally convicted the 12 accused for murder and rape. While I was at the airport, I saw her on the television in a press conference for the first time. She was in a burqa, confident. <coughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell and impossible to retain as well. <coughs> Finally, I tell, but you are then sworn to secrecy. Now I rest while you burn with my secret. So you change its clothes, my name, the appearance of the characters, the geography of the location. Even the language of your story is new so that the secret can be reborn. Then it comes out into the public in disguise. It's actually mine, but now reborn. So now it's also yours. Is there an image that can trace the root of the bird flying in the sky? How to talk about pain? Is there an image for what lies behind suffering? When you wove that shawl in memory of her murder, why did you make the pattern so beautiful and the colors so vivid? You spoke of her and your design with so much love that I think I have to thank you for helping me to find my own words and pictures. Everyone recalls differently, individuals and communities. Differently alone and differently together. Maybe in words or in songs and stories. Probably in gestures, little pencil marks, or simply in a look. Maybe it can be recalled, but only through that stone under the tree, or in the tangent that lies in the new jewelry that she bought just yesterday. Or the wooden kitchen window from where she said to her child, that's from where we saw them take auntie down the street. 57 years ago. So, so the child remembers, of course, but auntie resides in the wooden window for eternity. That wooden window is the container of that morning, 57 years ago, and of every single day in time since then, since the day they took her away. Forwards and backwards, forever. You, me, auntie, the niece and the child, all together, hanging in midair, between the two verbs, in every street corner, behind the mechanic shop, outside the special economic zones, inside the universities, on the common lands between the fields, by the water mill in the Alpines, lies the little museum that contains that image filled with the secrets of time and the bulb and the knife and the cycle and the window and the fire from the pyre and maybe even one day the look of love that she sometimes fleetingly reveals. And one more thing, just before I forget. The company surveyors came in a helicopter the other day. The villagers fired arrows through stones and it could not land. So it flew away. Apparently, everyone cheered. We lost that image forever. There was no camera there. 
If you have cameras to spare, please leave them near the projector. And one last thing, 20 days ago, the company people came to take water from the irrigation reservoir. But the villagers built a brick and cement wall so they couldn't take the water. We had a camera, so the image of that wall is there for all times to come. Thank you.